We're, we're continuing in our studies of the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, we've been in this second chapter for a number of weeks. And it's been a blessing to me. I've learned some things. The Lord has revealed truths to me in studying this chapter. Uh, like in that 38th verse, when the Lord showed me, that's the first time the name of Jesus Christ was ever publicly preached. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The first time the name Jesus of Nazareth was preached with Christ Messiah, the Lord allowed Peter to bring that message forth. If you'll believe that name, if you'll believe Jesus is the Christ, you will receive the remission of sins. Amen. That was a blessing to me. And so we saw how what, what happened in the second chapter, this significant high water mark in the scriptures here is the Lord is showing that now that his son, the Holy Savior, has ascended to heaven in body and spirit, he's bringing something down spiritually and physically to, if you will, replace him, to minister in his stead until the Lord returns to set up his kingdom. And the spiritual is the Holy Spirit and the physical are the Holy Scriptures. Something physical and spiritual the Lord is giving in the stead of his his child who's now in heaven with him and uh, praying for us. And so we saw the Holy Spirit come in the first 13 verses and now we see the message of the Holy Scriptures through the 40th verse and we got there last week to verse 40. So now after this great message, what do we see happen in the rest of this chapter? Verses uh, 41 through 47, we see, Then they that gladly received his word, that's Peter's preaching, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let us comment on these verses going back to the 41st verse. The message has been preached. Many people were pricked in their hearts. They even asked, what what shall we do? Peter told them what to do. And we see that verse 41 Then they that gladly received His Word were baptized. And we notice here, there's an order to things. There was um, a reception of the Word followed by baptism. And this is an order that we're going to find throughout the Scriptures. There's first an understanding in their spirit. They heard what He said. They understood it in their spirit. They believed and received what they heard and understood in their heart and soul. So it goes from spiritual understanding to a receptivity in the heart and soul and then the final progression and the last thing down the line is a movement into the physical realm of the body and a baptism occurs. But the progression moves from spirit to soul to body. Why? Because God is a spirit. And He works with us spiritually first. He doesn't baptize us first and then put us into the church. He first brings us the Word. The Word, spiritual. The words that are spirit and life. God is a spirit and the the reception, the communication, the relationship is spiritual. And so there's spiritual Word given. Spiritual apprehension on the part of the hearer. Well, then you can reject or receive. But they that gladly received His Word were baptized. Those that receive what they've heard and understood and open their heart and soul and are transformed and conformed on the inside, then they go forth and are baptized. Spirit to soul to body. That is the progression. Who was in the audience? We saw earlier Jews out of every nation. So the apostle of the Jews, the apostle of the circumcision, brings forth a spiritual message about the Messiah, the man Jesus Christ from Nazareth. He's the Lord. He's God. He's the King. And those that understood and received gladly went on to be baptized, the baptism of repentance and remission. But it already worked in their heart. 
They were adults. Observe, they were adults. You don't see any children mentioned in this chapter. You don't see any infants mentioned in this chapter. You see men in this chapter. A grown people coming to the feast, not infants. I, I'm, I guess people baptize infants nowadays uh, in the body first. And then somehow that bodily baptism is supposed to do something spiritually in the soul. This is a book I have um, printed by Tan Books and Publishers, Authorized Translations of the Dogmatic Decrees of the Council of Trent, an exact English rendering of the original Latin, an approved translation to state and explain the doctrines of the church, the Catholic Church, in her, in her own words. All these translations have been approved by ecclesiastical authority with the cardinal's signature here. Here's the imprimatur of the cardinal, Archbishop of New York. And uh, these are approved. And this is from the Council of Trent. And this is um, Session 7, Council Trent, March 13th, 1547, Canon Number 13. If anyone saith that little children, for that they not have actual faith, are not after receiving baptism to be reckoned among the faithful. And this is in 1547, someone decreed baptism of infants would uh, somehow affect someone as the being part of the faithful. Of course, the scriptures we're looking at right here, there are adult people who are hearing the Word of God, understanding the Word of God, receiving what they understand, and then baptized later. So we have something a little contrary to the scriptures. So what do we do? Well, we believe the scriptures and put this book aside. Because the Word of God is what's been committed to us. Very simple. Very simple stuff. How easy these things. These things are cleared up so easily with the Bible. Okay. So, the Bible says there in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. It's hard for an infant to receive a word. Somebody did that to me when I was little. I was a few weeks old. A couple of people carried me around and somebody splashed water on my head. I didn't know what was going on. I think I cried at the time. It happens. No, you have to receive the Word of God. And if you do that gladly, with joy, in the heart, and the transformation takes place, then the baptism occurs. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now notice carefully, it says about 3,000 souls. Now this is the Holy Spirit writing in the Holy Scriptures and He's not telling you the exact amount that are written. Because the Lord knoweth them that are His. God knows how many were actually saved. We never truly know how many people are actually saved. And the, the adding to the church is the work of God. And we'll see this again in the last verse. The Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord knows. God looketh on the heart. There are people today in churches who go to churches, who become members of churches, who get baptized in churches that aren't a member of the church of Jesus Christ. And the Lord knows. So it's hard for a pastor just to take membership numbers and know. He doesn't know. I don't know. By the way, have you ever noticed we don't do that here? I don't take numbers. I don't keep numbers. I don't know. The Lord knows. My job is just to put forth the Word of God. Peter wasn't up there taking account. Hey guys, how many did we get? So he gave forth the word and the Lord looked on the hearts and the Lord added to the church the number that should be added even if some people jumped in the water that didn't belong there. The Lord knew who was there. Your baptism doesn't save you. It's the receiving of the word of God in your heart. Prove yourselves whether ye be in the faith, Paul says. How do you prove yourselves? By the Bible. Read through it a few times. Read through the Gospel of John. Read through the book of Romans. And the Holy Spirit will confirm to you whether or not you're a member of the faithful. And if you hate the book of Romans and the Gospel of John, odds are you're not saved. (laughs) Because people that love the Lord love John and Romans. And I get some religious people I can't get to read through those books. Curious. I don't know. All right. Verse 42. What happens to these folks? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued steadfastly. 
These people that received the word would be a picture of what Jesus had spoken to the men a couple years back in Matthew chapter 13. Go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 3, the Lord Jesus Christ, words of red. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Skip down to verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. Peter, Jewish apostle just preach the word of the kingdom to these people. The kingdom of heaven that the king has come. You crucified him, but he's God's king and God's raised him from the dead. And he preached the word of the kingdom to these people. And in the midst of that audience were all kinds of hearts, but the people that we're looking at here are the people in verse 23. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth because they continued steadfastly. Now, if you've ever planted a seed for a tree, after you plant that seed, you have to water that seed, water that seed, water that seed, and you know when the fruit comes out? Long time afterwards. And only if you continue steadfastly in doing what needs to be done. And these continued steadfastly, and they're going to bring forth fruit. And it's the steadfast continuance that really marks out the child of God that loves God. They continued steadfastly. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For ye know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Continue steadfast. That's a picture of what we have here. Go back to where we were in Acts chapter 2. What did they continue in? Doing signs and miracles and wonders? Chapter 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. There's a word removed from a lot of Bibles. Doctrine. In the apostles' doctrine. This is the first thing that the Holy Spirit in the Holy Scriptures brings your attention to in a number of people that are brought to the Lord Jesus Christ on the first day of preaching publicly at Pentecost. The first thing. He says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. This means a lot to the Lord that we stay in doctrine. Doctrine is very important scripturally. Doctrine is the unchanged, unchangeable teaching given by a master. The Savior, Lord, and Master, Jesus Christ. First time it ever appears in the Bible, back in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. We're going to look at the word doctrine for a little bit. Because this is what they continued in. And here would be my desire for you if you are a Christian and you are like-minded to these people that gladly received the Word and were baptized one day. The Lord would have you to do the same thing, continue steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine. That's what a Christian ought to do, someone who is in Christ. That's what these apostles and these men did in the first church. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Notice, the words of God, the speech of God comes in the form of doctrine. My doctrine to the heavens and the earth. God has an unchangeable teaching that he'd like to communicate from where he is down to a people who seem every time they vote to say, you know what, we need some change. And God says, no, I've got a teaching that won't change. Amen. And the fashion of this world changeth every time we turn around. You can't keep up with it. 
If you actually try to dress according to the fashion of this world, I see the women shaking their head. You couldn't afford it. And God says, I've got something that doesn't change. It's my doctrine. An unchangeable teaching. Well, you know, times are different now. You need to understand the historical and cultural context of what was going on. No, you don't, God says. I haven't changed one bit up here in eternity. And you can either line up with me or line up with an ever-shifting, changing world that's tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But my doctrine doesn't change. He says, uh, turn to a Matthew chapter 7. The first time doctrine is ever found in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 7. The first time you'll ever find doctrine in the New Testament. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, for I give you good doctrine. Listen to what your heavenly father says. Matthew chapter 7. We've just come off three solid chapters of red ink. If you have a red letter edition of your Bible, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It was preached by the king, Jesus himself, preaching to the kingdom. This is going to be the laws of the kingdom. And it ends in Matthew chapter 7 with this, when he's all done. Verse 28. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority. And not as the scribes. What are scribes like? You ever go to scribe? Even modern scribes. They're out there. Saying to a scribe, what does this passage of Scripture mean? I don't know. Let me check the Greek. Well, you know, I got this concordance here. The Greek could say this and the Hebrew says this and I don't know. And, as a, and Jesus comes up and says, you know what it says? It's real plain and simple. You must be born again. Amen. In English, that's what it says. And Jesus doesn't run around with shell games of different words. He teaches as one having authority. The doctrine hasn't changed. It's from the Father in Deuteronomy 32 to the Son in Matthew 7. The doctrine is the same. Old and New Testament. God is merciful. God is holy. You're sinful and merciless. So bow the knee. And God will have mercy upon you. And the doctrine doesn't change. So Jesus said in John chapter 7 when some of the uh, scribes and Pharisees who had this uh, confusing, changing doctrine were arguing with him in John 7. John chapter 7, verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught and the Jews, that's the Jewish leaders, that's the scribes, that's the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they marveled saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? He didn't go to our seminary. We've never ordained him. Who does he think he is teaching the Word of God? Verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just bowing the knee to my Father and communicating the same doctrine. You know what they continued steadfastly in? The Apostles' Doctrine. You know what the Apostles' Doctrine was? The doctrine that Jesus taught them for three and a half years. Who did he get it from? His Father. It's an unbroken chain from the Father to the Son to the prophets and apostles. That's what they continued steadfastly in. They didn't add any new things, some new thing. They didn't take anything away. They diminished not a word. They continued steadfastly in the doctrine of the Father and the Son. Christian, I hope the same is applying in our lives. The doctrine of the Father and the Son giving the Holy Scriptures. Turn to the uh, back of your Bible, 2 John, before Revelation. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine. What doctrine would that be that the Apostles would continue in? Well, the Apostle John will give you an idea right here. 2 John. Second John, the apostle writes in verse 1, the elder, that would be John, unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth for the truth's sake. Verse 4, I, re- I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. See, he's saying, you're staying in the truth, in the Bible. What truth would that be? Verse 9, he warns them. Whosoever transgresseth 
and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What doctrine was that? It was the doctrine of Christ. Hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Jesus said, my doctrine is not my own. It's my Father's. The doctrine of the Father given to the Son, making the doctrine of Christ handed to the apostles. They continued steadfastly in that doctrine, the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ. We have a six-part teaching here that we did on the doctrine of Christ in tape form. It goes through this very verse. This doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, is essential to Christianity. Because Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is Christ. And so the doctrine has to be Christ's doctrine. An erroneous doctrine produces a false Christ, resulting in a counterfeit brand of Christianity. So this tape, we searched the scriptures and went through the doctrine of Christ, the person of Christ, the work of Christ, the lordship of Christ. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. That's the doctrine they continued steadfastly in. There's too many doctrines today. There's, there's too many erroneous things hopping and popping in and out of Christianity. Go back, Paul warns a young preacher. Go to 1 Timothy. Christianity is awash with all kinds of newfangled ideas. They get them from Madison Avenue. They get them from Hollywood. They get them from universities. But these men continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, which is the Doctrine of Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I uh, uh, besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, skip down to verse 6. Um, no, excuse me. I, I, I abide at Ephesus. So he's got him teaching in Ephesus. And the point is, he says, I want you to do some teaching here at Ephesus. Go to chapter 4 and verse 6. While you're at Ephesus, this is what you do. Chapter 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. He says, the whole purpose of the ministry that, that God the Father, through Jesus, gave me as an apostle, and I'm now handing this ministry to you, and through the ages this will be handed down, is the good doctrine of the words of faith, nourished up, and they're about Jesus Christ. It's being a ministry about Jesus Christ. It's the doctrine of Christ. That's what I'm giving you. I'm not giving you anything else, Timothy. Any, that's, that's it. That's what God gave Jesus. That's what Jesus gave us. And that's what we're giving you. And hopefully you'll give that to someone else. And they'll pass it down the line. And someday, in the year 2000 and something, there will be a man there that will have the doctrine of Christ that will stand up and nourish up in the words of the doctrine of Christ. And nothing else. No matter what the world's doing around. That's the desire that God had. Uh, skip down to verse, uh, same chapter, 4th chapter 15. Meditate upon these things and continue steadfastly in them. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. For in, in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, now he's not saving himself and that he's bringing salvation to his soul. What he's doing is he's saving his ministry to a point that when he speaks... Those that listen go, he's no hypocrite. You know, he seems to have a one-track mind. It's very narrow-minded. This guy's on a narrow way and a straight gate, and that's all he talks about is the doctrine of Christ. And if I come to hear Timothy teach or preach, he's going to be nourishing me up in the doctrine of Christ. And so, therefore, I can trust this. And I can, he's not a double-minded man up there. But in order to do that, Timothy himself had to take heed to himself and the doctrine. Timothy had to spend personal time continuing steadfastly with the Lord in order to do this. That's what's required. That's what's required. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul, Paul is training this young man, Timothy. If, if you are desiring to be a teacher of the Word of God, you want to read these two epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. These are two young men that Paul trained 
as to how to be faithful ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'll give you a charge. I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Paul recognized? (laughs) Paul realized, no matter where I go, God's watching me. And and when I communicate to someone and I, I give a charge to someone, it's before the eyes of God and Jesus Christ. Paul understood the seriousness of the ministry he was in. He just couldn't draw a veil up there and God couldn't see and so I'm doing something in secret here in a corner. He realized every time I speak as an ambassador of Christ, God and Jesus are watching me. So therefore, I better speak the words of Jesus Christ. It's the safest thing to preach from a pulpit. And I charge thee before... And I, he used the word charge. I like that. I use that word. I don't like to change the words of the Bible. I like to use the words of the Bible because the Word of God is quick. It's sharper than anything else out there. So I don't use challenge. I use charge, exhort. Those are the words God uses. I want to use God's words. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that's saved people, and the dead, that's lost people, at his appearing in his kingdom. This is what you do, Timothy. Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Long-suffering, that's your own patience, Timothy. I mean, it's, you're going to sometimes get frustrated. You say the same thing over and over and over. Long-suffering like the Lord. Remember, sheep go astray. Repeat it. Long-suffering. That's for you personal spirit. For your Holy Spirit, doctrine. Doctrine. Some, in other words, Timothy, you might get frustrated and go, you know, I'm not reaching these people with this doctrine. Let me try another way to reach them. No, no. You continue with long suffering in your own spirit and with the Holy Spirit's doctrine. Amen. You don't change it no matter what the people do. Amen. You continue in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. They continued steadfastly in that doctrine. Why? Why do you tell that? Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And then you go, you know, if I want to follow that crowd, I want to keep that crowd, I got to change with that crowd. Continue steadfastly in the doctrine of the apostles. And if they leave, there's a door. Let them leave. Timothy, I charge you, you preach that doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We live at a time now where there's all other kinds of doctrines. Jesus talked about the doctrines of men in Mark chapter 7. Timothy is warned back in the first epistle about the doctrines of devils. Winds of doctrines that come. They'll actually be like fables. Goofy things like, you know, maybe God works through evolution. Now, if that's not... Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. There's no scientific facts for it. Why would God work through a fable like that? But all kinds of goofy things will come up there. What do you do? Continue steadfastly in the doctrine of Christ. That's the Apostles' doctrine. I charge thee, Timothy. God is watching. He will judge you for what you do in that pulpit. This, this stuff here, you know, this, you know, in order to have the right doctrine, you need the right book. Notice, it's doctrine singular, not doctrines plural. One singular thing. Uh, turn back, I saw Jesus. Remember, Jesus' doctrine, Matthew chapter 7. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. That was the bingo numbers. If anybody's interested, I'll repeat them. (laughs) The lawn fate will be next week. Um, um, Anyways, Matthew chapter 6. The Lord says this when he's teaching his folks about being salt and light and the importance of the right light. He says in verse 22, 
The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Single. One. One doctrine. One Bible confirming that one doctrine. Not multiple Bibles. Not multiple doctrines. Single. Verse 23. But if thine eye be evil, thy body shall be full of, full of darkness. And great is that darkness. What we live in is a time of faith. Turned away from the truth and believing that there's all different kinds of Bibles God has written. There's only one Bible. There's one Lord. There's one doctrine. There's one Bible. And those doctrines are changed in the other Bibles. I know I've been teaching the Bible for 12 years. And when I first started, I had those other imitation Bibles. And the words didn't line up. The only way I could study the Bible was not using the Bible. I had to put the little thing called the Bible aside and read books about it to get the truth and then go pull the verses afterwards to make them line up. But in here, I open the King James Bible and the words line up and all the messages come right from here. All you need is a single look of this book and you'll be full of light. And that's how I do all this teaching. Folks, I don't teach from commentaries. I don't teach from other people's works. I read this book. And the only aids I have with me are, are a concordance so I can find some of those words where they line up in different parts of the Bible and a dictionary because I get confused and then my, thankfully my sister gave me a thesaurus because I don't have a lot of linguistic skills and that when I'm putting a message together trying to alliterate it, the thesaurus helps me find some of those words. But when it comes to the teaching and the doctrine, it's single, it's right out of here. It's the doctrine of Christ. It's continuing steadfastly in this this thing here, this purpose-driven life is uh, why I use so many translations. I use so many translations. He goes on for the reasons he does this. And he's got a number of translations. Great is the darkness and the confusion. This is not the Apostles' Doctrine. The Apostles' Doctrine is in the Bible. Right here. It's the doctrine of Christ. That's what we need to continue steadfastly in. Let me show you. I'm going to show you quickly. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And the Bible speaks of a way to come to the life is the path of life. It's the path that leads you into Jesus Christ and the path that you continue on, the path of life. And it's only found two times in your Bible. Once in Psalms and once in Proverbs. I want you to get your fingers there. Go number one to uh, Proverbs chapter 5 and put a finger there. Proverbs chapter 5. The difference between the Apostles' doctrine, which is truth, and winds of doctrines, doctrines of men, doctrines of devils, plural, which is error. Proverbs 5 in one hand. And then Psalm 16 in the other hand. (coughs) Psalm 16. Now we know we're in Acts chapter 2. He just quoted from Psalm 16 in his message as he preached. So Psalm 16 is an important psalm. And here's what he says in the last verse. Talking to the Lord. First verse, preserve me, O God. Speaking to the Lord. Verse 7, I will bless the Lord. I've set the Lord. Thou, talking to the Lord, the Holy One. 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In Thy presence is fullness of joy. At Thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The path of life will be shown by the God. Not paths of life, a singular path of life. That's the one time it's mentioned favorably here in the Bible. Watch it in Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, speaking about verse 3, the lips of a strange woman. Spiritually, this is a picture of false religion, the harlot. The, the, the true woman is the chaste virgin bride of God and the false strange woman is the bride of the devil, the many brides of the devil that have their false religions. The lips of the strange woman, verse 4, her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, 
Her steps take hold on hell. If you want to believe the lies of any religion other than God's true apostle doctrine, doctrine of Christ, you will end up in hell because you must be born again. And, and the strange woman has all her re- religions all over the world that she's put out there to, to bring people into and get them to believe it in sincerity. God doesn't want your sincerity. He wants your faith in what he said. Amen. And they end up in hell. And look what it says here, verse 6. Lest thou shouldst pander, ponder the path of life. That's what God would like you to ponder. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. She's always changing her doctrines. She's always changing her writings. She's always got a new Bible that just came out this week that's better than the one before. And a new thing, she's always changing. That's the work of the strange woman. The path of life is found in Psalm 16. And what verse was it found in? Strange. That's a strange coincidence, isn't it? That's the only place in your Bible it's found mentioned like that. Only two places it's found. Proverbs 5 where it's wrong and Psalm 16 where it's right. 16.11. 16.11. 16.11. 16.11. The Apostles' Doctrine. The Doctrine of Christ. That's what God wants you to continue in. There's fullness of joy. There's pleasures evermore. Especially at the right hand. If you hold your Bible, you know what testament's in your right hand? The New Testament. <laughs> Amen. That's where I got all my joy when I found out that Christ has come. All right. So, go back to where we were in, in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Notice that's given the preeminence in the verse as to what they continued in. After the apostles' doctrine, that was the most important thing, then is the fellowship of the saints. The, the, the spiritual fellowship that they would have. When they got together continuing in, in the Apostles' Doctrine, four or five of them would get together, they would continue in the Apostles' Doctrine, fellowshipping in the Apostles' Doctrine. The greatest times I have are when I get together with other Christians that love the Word of God, and there aren't many of them, and we just sit down around a table and we break open the Bible and we read together out loud. And Brother Ed reads a few verses. And I read a few verses. And Brother Marco reads a few verses. And then we comment. Brother Jack reads. And then we comment back and forth. And we have fellowship in in the doctrine of Christ. That's the greatest fellowship we have. Spiritual fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. No comma between. That was the fellowship in the Apostles' Doctrine. Comma. And in breaking of bread. Okay, and some physical fellowship too. Let's have a little food here. But that was secondary to them. I hope it is with you too. I just don't want to get together with a bunch of Christians to eat. Nothing personal. But you want to get together with me, do Bible study, I'll show up. Throw a party for me, I might not make it. People know. I'm not interested in food. The secondary. Bible study, I'll be there. You can count on me. Apostles, doctrine, and fellowship. And in the breaking of bread. And in prayers. Probably how they close their meetings. That's how we close ours. We end with prayer. Make the rounds in prayers. I love doing that. Verse 43. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now, I notice this carefully. The Lord breaks this verse into two parts. Fear came upon every soul. Who are the souls? Verse 41. They gladly received the word. They were baptized. They were added about 3,000 souls. The souls is representing believers here. And there's a, there's a break between the souls and the apostles. And God makes it clear. Fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, not by the souls, not by the believers. Why? The book is titled The Acts of the Apostles. Well, I think it should be called The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Well, God thought it should be called The Acts of the Apostles. Amen. Because that's who he's working through. And they're the ones that do signs and wonders, and you don't. And trying to change the title of the book to hope you can appropriate this kind of power is just a spiritual larceny. And God won't have any part in it. The devil will. He'll be more than happy to work some false miracles and signs and wonders with you. But God won't have any part in it. And so God puts the division right there in the verse carefully, if you'll slow down and read it, rather than run through it at 30 miles an hour. 
which is what a lot of teachers do. The, the apostles have the signs and wonders. Look, okay, go, uh, chapter 5, same book. Chapter 5, same book. God will reiterate and expand upon it. Apostles, a foundation laid at the time of Jesus Christ. They have signs, miracles, and wonders. We don't. First off, we're not Jewish. And the Jews require a sign. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Watch this. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Now watch verse 13. And of the rest, this is the other souls that were saved, durst no man join himself to them. But the people magnified them. You know what they understood? They said, you know what? God is making a division here. Listen to me. God is making a division within the body of Christ by office. Okay? You're all the same in terms of your salvation. Jew, Gentile, male, female, free, bond. There's no division there in terms of salvation. But in terms of office, God is choosing offices. And certain people have an office and certain don't. And don't you pretend you have that office if you don't. The people back then had enough common sense not to do it. And when we read the fifth chapter, you'll see why. And I sometimes wish God would do that today in some of these full gospel churches. But that's another story. We'll read it when we get there. Um, they had enough common sense not to pretend they were apostles. And, and so should we. And we're not. And so God makes that division very uh, careful. The, there is a distinction in office. And God will choose who gets what office. It's God's choice. It's not ours, folks. If God has chosen you for an office in His body, if, if, if I'm talking to someone that God has chosen to be a pastor and teacher and you're too young to know it, but God already knows it and He's working on you, you'll know it. And so will those that hear you. They'll stand back and they'll go, he's got the gift of God. I mean, it's apparent. And then there's no envy. I go back to where we were in Acts chapter 2. Watch this. Verse 43. And fear came upon every soul, comma, or whatever that thing is, a colon, colon, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. There's a division. There's an office here, and then there's believers here, and God's got this office of apostles, verse 44, and all that believed were together. In other words, we still have spiritual unity. We're not upset that God has chosen some people to, to be an apostle and not me to be an apostle. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. And I'm not upset that God didn't make me an apostle or prophet. I'm thankful that He saved my soul. <laughs> And that's good enough for me. And I rejoice when someone is. Well, there are no apostles and prophets today. I read about the ones that were then and I rejoice over them. And when some, God calls an evangelist. I'm thrilled that there's a man that's an evangelist that can get up in a meeting and talk to 30,000 people and thousands get saved and I can't do that. It, well, that's not my gift. That was his gift. Praise the Lord. I rejoice. Christ is being preached and people are getting saved. I'm together with that brother. I pray for that brother. I support that brother. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1. Despite the fact there were differences in office, the believers were not upset over it. They were together. They were in unity over it. 1 Corinthians, going down to chapter 3, watch this. Where, when there does become a division and people envy the gifts of others, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul says this, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? That was the old man. Before we were saved, we were envious. Oh, that rich guy, you know, that Frenchman, Taylor, Taylor, could pull him down out of that car and make him walk on the street next to me. And attack him. That's old man stuff. Now, in the body of Christ, when there's a rich one spiritually that God's gifted to be an apostle, amen, the Lord's working in that man. The Lord's saving souls by that guy. No division, no strife, no envy. Acts chapter 2, great chapter. Yes, there are differences in office, and yet the people were still together. Verse 44, And all that believed were together in the unity of the faith, in the unity of the Spirit, in the unity of Christ. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Listen. When I got saved, 
and I realized Jesus Christ could change people's eternities, I wanted people to get saved. And I started going and telling people about Jesus Christ and passing out tracts and everything. And there was a time when I desired that the Lord would allow me to, to pastor at a church, but He didn't. It wasn't time. And He pulled back. And I would go out and take the, the, the tracts of people from other churches and pass those out and send people to other churches because I wanted them to get saved and I didn't care whether they came to me or anyone else. Get saved and go to that church. And I still pass out tracts from other churches and I pastor a church. I have some of my faithful brethren that have churches and I carry some of their tracts and I'll pass them out. If I'm in the region, I'll say, you know, that's a great church. You ought to go there. Why? Christ is being preached. People are getting saved. You can grow in the faith. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And they understood this in Acts chapter 2. What a great chapter where the Holy Spirit is moving. And the preeminence is Christ. Verse 44, And all that believe were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now, what's happening here is we're seeing that there's a spiritual unity first. Now there's a material unity. They're taking their possessions and they're sharing them one amongst another. Now, Acts chapter 2. Jerusalem, kingdom of heaven being preached by a Jewish preacher to Jewish men. What's the picture here? This is a picture of the activity of believing Jews getting ready for the tribulation. Because God is making the offer in these next two, three, four, five, six, and seven. In these next six chapters, God is going to offer to these people that He'll send His Son back and set up the kingdom. They'll go through the seven-year trip first, but He'll, set him back, he'll send them back. God's making a legitimate offer, a second offer of repentance and salvation to the nation Israel. And that's what's being preached here. And they're getting ready to go into the tribulation. This does not apply to us as Gentile believers. How do I know that? I've got church epistles. Okay, Let me take you to a few to show you. Remember, you've got to rightly divide. This is Jewish. This is not Gentile. This does not apply to you. God's not trying to set up a communistic church. He doesn't believe in that. How do I know? I have church epistles. Let's take a look. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. When you want to get your doctrine for the church, you read the church epistles. You read from Romans to Philemon. That's where you'll get your church doctrine. We're reading an historical account of what Jews were doing. And we need to rightly divide it. Ephesians chapter 4. Picking it up in verse uh, 28. And he's talking about the unity of the church at this point in the beginning of, you know, one body, one spirit in the beginning of the chapter. And here he says, verse 28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. God expects Gentile believers to go out and to continue to work and to labor and not to steal and not to have other Christians steal from you. But you go out and you work. Uh, go to uh, uh, Second Thessalonians. A couple books to the right. Now what you do with your goods, that's your business. But God expects the Gentiles to work and continue to stay in the workplace where God saved you so you can get other people saved in that workplace. He's not sending you out in the tribulation. You're not supposed to see the abomination of desolation and flee out to the mountains and take care of one another in a commune. That's not what's happening. But that was what was being prepared to happen in Acts chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, picking it up in verse 10. For when we were with you, Gentile church, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Wait, I thought it was communistic. I mean, Brother Rich over there has got all kinds of money. He's got plenty of food for all of us. No. No, you go out and work for a living. You go out and work if you expect to eat. Well, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 doesn't apply to you. You're a Gentile church in Thessalonica. And it doesn't apply to you. You're a Gentile church in Amherst, New York. It's a historical picture of what the Jews are going to be doing in the tribulation. And they would have been doing it, but you're going to see they're going to reject God's offer again in chapter 7. So that's what's going on. You can read the rest of the verses on your own. It's not for the Gentile church. Now, let's go back to where we were. They had all things common. We're running out of time, Joey says. So I'll probably have to finish next week. 
this error. You see, people rest the Scriptures to their own and others' destruction. God doesn't expect His church to be communistic. He certainly doesn't expect a country to be communistic. And people have literally, ungodly people have rested this passage from Acts to, to, to come up with things like communism, Karl Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, people like that. But rightly dividing the word of truth, we understand. This is an offer being made of the kingdom to the nation Israel, and they're going to need to be, if you will, communal <laughs> in that period of tribulation when no man can buy or sell. That's what they're going to have to do. Any questions on what we've been looking at? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the teaching in Acts chapter 2. Uh, thank you for the salvation at Calvary's cross in Jesus Christ. Help us to be steadfast and continue in the doctrine of Christ and to lead others to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.